Good morning, everyone. Morning. May the peace of the Lord be with you. Let's sing one more time in our final week in the exilic literature. Let's sing the round by the waters of Babylon. So we've got group one, we've got group two. I don't know, we might have to split Joyce and Don down there. And, and then group three, once all together, twice in parts. like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land from where we gather and from where we broadcast today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I would like to pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging and pledge our ongoing commitment to reconciliation and justice for First Peoples and others in this land. In recent weeks, we have been making connections between our lives and the story of God's people in exile. And we have read selections from the prophet Jeremiah. Today, we conclude this journey with this remarkable man, Jeremiah, for now. And we hear again the great promise of a new beginning in relationship with God. So... Let us allow God to breathe life and hope into us. Let us listen for God's word and be open to God's nudging. And let's lay down our burdens and receive from God's grace as we worship God together. And let's stand and sing together the song, Come to the Waters. Everyone
Welcome everyone on Zoom and on video, on the phone and here in person. Our prayer of confession, let us pray. Lord, forgive us when we've closed our eyes to the things that matter, when we've prior prioritised the trivial surface matters over urgent needs and deep-seated injustice. Forgive us when we've chosen to look away from those who need us the most. Forgive us when we have stretched ourselves so thin that we don't have time and energy for that which you call us to do and to be. Forgive us and restore us, we pray. Give us what we need to live, love and pray persistently in the power and counsel of your spirit. Amen. The Lord comes to us with a new covenant saying, I will write my law on your hearts. I will forgive your wrongdoing and remember your sins no more. Sisters and brothers, hear the word of grace. Your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. We sing the wonderful old hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, which Joseph Scriven wrote to, to comfort his ailing mother in Ireland. And he also wrote from deep personal experience of um, being down in the pits of life and grief and finding God's comfort and presence through prayer. So let's join with him in singing What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Charlie, I've been wondering, have you had any basketball this week? How did that go? Good. Good. Anything special in the game? Mm, no? Well, we first are better team than our team because they've been practising more than my team 
and to my team Josh. Yeah, that'll happen and sometimes. So we do training on Wednesdays yeah. and we do the games on Saturdays. Wow. And you will just keep improving with the more training and learning, won't you? That will be exciting. Any other highlights from the week to mm. tell me and everybody? Anything special? Mm. Nothing special going on? Well, I think it's next week that my nana is having a birthday and I think we're going and we're going to have a holiday for her birthday and it's going to be a really special holiday and she's turning eighty. Oh. So she's seventy nine and she's going to turn eighty next week. So special weekend. birthday with your Nana, 80th birthday, and having a holiday to see her. Wonderful. Now, Charlie, I wonder, I don't know if, if you know these characters that Kelsey's just putting up on the screen. Do you recognise who they are? Yes. Who can you see there? The bear is Winnie the Pooh, and I think... The one that's really, really little is, I forgot the name. Pig, P P Pig. Piglet. Yeah. And the tiger is, mm, I forgot. It's something like the word for tiger. Similar. Mm. Tiger. And yeah. I forgot the boy's name. The boy's name is Christopher. And I have lots of stories about them. I have a Christmas one, a normal one. I have about three stories Great. of them. And they're very long stories. <laughs> long stories. <laughs> they're among my mum's favourites. And so when I was a boy, my sister and brother and I, we got to hear lots of Winnie the Pooh stories as well. Christopher Robin is rescuing Winnie the Pooh in that picture, isn't he? Uh, bit, of a, bit of a flood going on, which makes it all the more appropriate today as we think about uh, people who are dealing with floods in um, Victoria and other parts of Australia. Uh, but that's one story. What I want to focus on is the story with this picture here, this next picture, that has a few more characters in there. They're a bit smaller and not quite as well known, but do you, reckon, do you know the names of any of the other mm. ones there? The main one that I want to talk... Well, the one, that's, the one that I... I've definitely forgotten is the little rabbit. The little, oh, the little rabbit? Yeah, the yellow rabbit. Anybody? Rabbit. Rabbit, yes, that's right, that's his name. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so the, the main one I want to talk about with you uh, is the donkey. And did you hear what Charlene said the donkey's name was? Did you remember that one? Mm -hmm. The, the noise that a donkey makes. Eeyore. Eeyore. Yep. So can you see Eeyore in that picture? Yes. And see what sort of face he's got on? Sad. Sad. Which is quite common for Eeyore, isn't it? <laughs> if you know the stories. And Winnie the Pooh, he's looking up. Would you, what would you say about his face? Mm, worried. A bit worried? But he's not like Eeyore worried, <laughs> who's got his head down. And he's worried because they've fallen down a pit that they were trying to trap a heifalump in. And Christopher Robin had told them not to do something silly like that because they might fall down themselves. <laughs> and that's what's happened. There they are, down the pit. And... Eeyore is really, really worried, like he usually is. He's thinking, oh dear, oh no. And he's always lazy. He's always lazy because he doesn't have a lot of hope in what's going on in the future. And 
he thinks Christopher Robin is going to be really angry with them for disobeying him and getting himself stuck down in this pit. Whereas Winnie the Pooh, looking up, is a bit worried, but he's still hoping something might happen. What do you reckon he's hoping? He's hoping that those stuff that are sticking down will fall down and they'll be able to climb back up. Oh, use those little ropes that you're seeing up there, yeah. Because there's about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine yeah. people and two people can go on each thing. Yeah, they could too, couldn't they? And he's also hoping and trusting that Christopher Robin will actually come and help them to get out even though they've messed up. They've done something stupid and ended up down that pit. Because Christopher Robin loves them and they belong to Christopher Robin, he will still come and help them get out. And that's a bit like the things that we're thinking about today with, um, about God you know, in the stories that we're going to be having that God's a bit like the Christopher Robin in this story because he does come along and he does love the people and he does say, that was stupid, you didn't do what I said, but I'm going to help you out and I'm going to help you to start again. And so it's a lovely story on its own, but it also helps us to think about God a little bit today. And I don't think Sue's going to be here, but... If you wanted to grab a, um, a uh, one of those little magazines out there, there's a few couple of things in there that Charlie might like to do, and we will sing the song "Hearts on Fire." Let's stand and sing. So the Old Testament reading is one more from Jeremiah when um, lots of the Judaites are in exile in Babylon and Jeremiah, after spending years warning people about the consequences of their disobe uh, disobeying God and not living God's way, 
now that they're down the pit, he brings to them God's word of hope for how God will renew the relationship with them. And then the gospel reading, Jesus giving a bit of a pep talk in a strange way to our ears somewhat as to um, don't give up on praying. Thanks, Dad. Our first reading is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 27 to 34 of the Good News Translation. I, the Lord, say that the time is coming when I will fill the land of Israel and Judah with people and animals. And just as I took care to uproot, to pull down, to overthrow to destroy and to demolish them. So I will take care to plant them and build them, build them up. When that time comes, people will no longer say, the parents ate the sour grapes, but the children got the sour taste. Instead, those who eat sour grapes will have their own teeth set on edge and everyone will die because of their own sin. The Lord says, the time is coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Although I was like a husband to them, they did not keep that covenant. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach a neighbour to know the Lord because all will know him, all will know me, from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. Our second reading is from the Gospel of Luke. Chapter 18, verses 1 to 8, and again, the Good News translation. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to teach them that they should always pray and never become discouraged. In a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected people. And there was a widow in that same town who kept coming to him and pleading for her rights, saying, help me against my opponent. For a long time, the judge refused to act, but at last he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or respect people, yet because of all the people this widow is giving me, all the trouble indeed, uh, I will see to it that she gets her rights. If I don't, she will keep on coming and finally wear me out. And the Lord continued, listen to what that corrupt judge said. Now will God not judge in favour of his own people who cry to him day and night for help? Will he be slow to help them? I tell you, He will judge in their favour and do it quickly. But will the Son of Man find faith on earth when he comes? This is the word of our Lord. Thanks. Thanks to God. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, please guide our thoughts our reflecting, our talking. Amen. I've ordered a book for myself online, This Brave New World. Can you show us the first slide, please, Kelsey? And the book is called You Are Not Your Own. Belonging to God 
in an inhuman world. I, um, I found it when I was searching up what people have to say that's got onto the internet about belonging and grace. And this book's by an American academic called Alan Noble. And here's one of the blurbs about it. Oh. You are your own and you belong to yourself. That is the fundamental assumption of modern life. And if we are our own, then it's up to us to forge our own identities and to make our lives significant. But while that may sound empowering, it turns out to be a crushing responsibility, one that never actually delivers on its promise of a free and fulfilled life, but instead leaves us burned out, depressed, anxious and alone. This phenomenon is mapped out into the very structures of our society and helps explain our society's underlying disorder. But the Christian gospel offers a strikingly different version, as the Heidelberg Catechism puts it. I am not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful saviour, Jesus Christ. So in this book, in You Are Not Your Own, Alan Noble explores how this simple truth reframes the way we understand ourselves, our families, our society and God. Contrasting these two visions of life, he invites us past the sickness of contemporary life into a better understanding of who we are and to whom we belong. He had written a book about... Um, sin and addressing sin in people's lives and the problem of sin in our world. But he said as he was writing it, he realised the other, another big th challenge in people's lives, apart from what's going on inside us, is what's happening from the outside and these messages that we're getting about you can, you can and should do it all yourself. And that's why he got into this and he spends about 100 pages exploring what he calls the disorders created by the understanding that you belong to yourself. And then he spends a similar amount unpacking how the gospel is counter to that and how, paradoxically, it's liberating with grace playing a central role. So I'm looking forward to reading it. Should get it early next week and then I'll keep it at church for anyone who wants to, to skim or to, to borrow it. I looked at a bit of an interview by him with somebody else talking about it and realised that he, he actually wants us to be mindful of how this self-belonging view is in others and it is in ourselves because it's... It's, we're surrounded by this sense of um, autonomy and the need to make ourselves and define ourselves. So he's not writing this so that we can be judgmental or self-righteous or say, oh, no, I belong to God. He's saying we've all got this around us. But if we understand it and we're gracious about this with others and ourselves, there is a liberation in that. And um, he tells some stories about students that he teaches who he worries about because they'll be doing stuff and then they will just be crushed by the anxiety of uh, what they need to do in their lives and, and, and in, um, in achieving. So I'm saying that today to get us thinking about what difference does it make to you to belong to God and to belong to this church here.
In our Bible reading, the Jews were in exile in Babylon and the ones who get to read Jeremiah's words are the ones who are still trusting that they belong to God still and that God is going to renew the covenant with them and their people. So these people who've lost almost everything in their lives and are in this foreign land, what do they do? Well, some of them give up and just become part of the Babylonian community. But a big number of them, they keep on practising the Shabbat, the Sabbath. They don't have a temple to go to and make sacrifices. They don't have priests. They, um, they don't have their, um, their Torah available to them there. But they keep doing the Sabbath when they remember God. They honour God and they rest. And they kept on observing their religious holidays, which of course helped them to remember their story of the times when God rescued them, of the times when God called them into to new life. And so for 50 years, they maintained their sense of identity and faith despite the circumstances where it would have been easy to conclude either God had abandoned them or that the Babylonian God, Marduk, was more powerful than their God. They didn't go for either of those, but they followed Jeremiah's advice to settle in, to work and pray for the good of the city in which they found themselves. It wasn't where they wanted to be, but it's where they had to be for now. So work and pray for the good of the city. And they also get inspiration a little bit later in the book of Jeremiah when Jeremiah does this really symbolic act. And so he's in this land of Judah that's been um, devastated and he goes and buys a block of land, a worthless, useless block of land because of his hope and confidence in God that one day the land will be restored to God's people. And so then, remarkably, in 538 BCE, Cyrus, the Persian emperor, conquers Babylon and says, you Jews, I would like you to go back to your land and worship your God. So we live in a time when in, in some ways it's like the church is being exiled. We live in a time when the church uh, has been disgraced in many ways by scandals and we live in a time when um, the community generally is, is saturated in the, the secular worldview of personal autonomy, consumer culture. We live in a time when people are scared about gathering in groups, scared about trusting leaders of all kinds. So this raises plenty of questions for us, like what are we doing as part of God's church in this time? What are we offering to God? What might God do through us? So as part of responding to these questions and thinking about the time in which we live, we've been working as a congregation to renew our vision for who we are, whose we are, what we're seeking to be and to do. So over the last couple of months, we've chewed on some of these questions. You can have the next slide, Kelsey, please. So a little while back, we had a discussion about what matters to you in living out your faith with Coatesville Uniting Church. And we ended up with a, a bit of a graphic here with um, worshipping matters, 
growing and giving matter and belonging matters to us. And grace seems to be central to all of it. And then on the next slide. You see that about a month ago we thought, well, we'll dig a bit deeper into um, some of these. And in groups, people looked at one of the, the main, one of those things that were important to us in a bit more depth. And the responses that we had on belonging included these. What does belonging look like? Welcoming, God-centred, active, not hiding ourselves, togetherness, supportive community, a gentle place to be received. I like this, belonging looks like coffee. Consideration for others, listening to others, a recognition of the life we are granted. What's belonging sound like? It sounds supporting and accepting. It sounds like talking. And it sounds like a signpost for the way ahead. And then a couple more of the questions we asked about it on the next slide. What does it feel like, this belonging? Okay, this church is my home. It actually feels encompassing. Peace. Relaxed. Reassurance. What's it like now and in your hopes in our space? Belonging is like community in action together. More people to join and invite, more families to belong with us. The idea for a, a book sharing and food sharing um, facility so that we can contribute more to our local community. And that we hope to have served God in every way. So those were some great things about belonging and then some, one group said some lovely things about grace. What does it look like? People are not bound by their past. See faces of relief and forward-looking purpose. What does it sound like? Voices less strained by the burdens of their past. Voices raised in thanks to God. And what does it feel like? Anxiety free. And if you've read your cross light from this month with my sister-in-law front page, you'll see that the picture on the front has her with a little message about the importance of a non-anxious God. Because somehow we're living in this time of anxiety everywhere and the significance of knowing that we belong to a non-anxious God. Next one, please, Kelsey. So, today, can we push a little further again in a little deeper in our thinking about our belonging to the God of grace who even if we've got ourselves into the pit or into exile, that God graciously comes to us to renew our relationship and revitalise us. What difference does it make to belong, in belonging to that God? And what difference does it make uh, to you and to others from your observations? And what difference does it make to you belonging to this congregation in this time? What difference does it make to you and to others belonging here? Not just belonging to yourself and being out in the world and having to define yourself and work out your own values and your own purpose and your own meaning and... Um, and when you mess up, drag yourself back. And What does it mean that you belong to God 
and to a congregation here and now. So could get some profound thoughts out of this, could get some thoughts that seem pretty simple on first saying, but please say it or write it down, even if you think, oh, it's a bit simple, because often those are the most profound. So I'll see if there's any questions in a moment, and then... Um, got a little sheet with a bit of a summary of what I've just gone through with you and a little section for you to write your, your thoughts and to talk with three other people, two or three people near you about your thoughts which might help you to jot a few extras down um, for about, uh, about five to seven minutes like we've done the previous two times. Okay, just as we're uh, gathering up the sheets, let's hear from a couple of people who have something they'd like to, to share as, as we go around. Thanks, Kels. Um, so me and Gail had a bit of a discussion about how belonging to Coatesville Uniting Church um, makes us feel like we're part of a family and there's a lot of friendship here and how it's um, good support as well. And we all support each other through good times and bad times and so that's um, a really significant thing that we feel um, belonging to here. Thank you. Anybody over here like to say something? We'll grab that from you, Robbie. You finished? Oh, no. Same. 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 Okay. Anybody over here like to? Um, are we answering the first question or the second? Or either Whatever you want to do. Well, I think um, belonging to a God of grace gives us a sense of peace and purpose and um, we're able to hand over our burdens. And I guess um, with regard to the uh, difference being congregationalists at uh, Coatesville Uniting, it's like a rock, we're part of the fabric, feel like a member of a church family, feel warm inside, feel well led, and it's a vibrant and engaging and energising experience. Testing? Yep. yep. Okay. We as a group said that um, it's some, being part of this church, we've got God to hand over our problems to and God will hold and carry us at times when we are in need of him. We think the church in Coatesville is a place to return to, always be able to return to and form relationships and be with each other. We live with others, it's like family, we know their weaknesses and when they need support as well as their strengths. And an interesting one, it challenges us to accept all types of people and then get to know them as well. <laughs> oh, it's, it's James here, just behalf on some of the people online. Uh, one of the things that was mentioned was a sense of peace and reassurance and also the hope that that can be spread to others through the church. So that sort of links the first two together. You probably won't be surprised who this is, but one person said he likes to compare the experience at Coatesville with the Anglican church he attends in the morning from attending Coatesville online. So if you know who that is, you'll be have it life like the rest of us. So. Another important thing was mentioned was that perhaps it could be summarised as stronger together, that being a collective gives strength, so you do things that are more uh, unlikely on your own, but far more likely as part of a, a graceful community. Uh, and so having that same sense of um, inspiration from God, but having support through the local <coughs> community. Um, I was just going to be very, very brief and say um, I think we sort of 
talked a, talked a little bit about um, God being a kind of fundamental and a basis of who we are. And um, I also wanted to share something. I hope Mandy doesn't mind that she said that for her, being part of Coatesville is um, like her singing and such is, is a part of her worship. And that was a really powerful thing to think that that's, you know, like it's her contribution, it's part of her definition and it's, it's part of her worship. And it was a good challenge to think about that, how that reflects for, for me and others, yeah, to have that, I suppose, a role, but it's actually a gift that she's really wanting to share and, yeah. Um, I'd like also say that because you, um, for me since I've retired or whatever, it's been the Springville um, board that I can get involved in the community and make a po positive difference by helping people through community care and the confidence of people helping me to learn how to become a um, host and that this church and the confidence in me. That's what I think is belonging in this place. Mm. Uh, following along the line of community care, uh, belonging to the God of grace and what difference does it make to others? So many of the people that come in to community care are so highly appreciative of the fact that somebody cares about them enough to do things to help them, even though they don't know who they are, but somebody's there prepared to care for them. Right. Um, belonging to the grace of God, we put, we have a sense of peace and support within this framework. And belonging to Coatesville Uniting Church, we put, we have a community of people held together. We feel dis supported. We like the discussion, a sense of love of all within this community, and acceptance of anyone who cares to come within the circle that is Coatesville Uniting Church. Good one. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your, uh, your thoughts and your sharing and for what you give to this community to allow it to be a place where uh, people can belong to God and people can belong to this community and share in the goodness and the spirit that is, that is part of here. That will all help us as we continue to shape up our, what we're going to say about our, ourselves and what we offer to the world as we um, put that together over the next few months and it helps to guide our um, priorities and our, um, our actions in the over the next year or two. You belong to God. It makes all the difference. Whether you're just facing everyday challenges or you're down in the pit or you're feeling exiled and alienated, God does not abandon you. But God comes to you in Jesus Christ and God gives you the heart to be there for others. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we worship God with our offering, let's sing the prayer, Give Us Hearts.
Holy mystery, we name God, just and faithful. Bless the offering of our lives and these symbols of our living in the plate and given digitally. May we help those who cry to you for comfort and for justice. Amen. And now the prayers of the people. At this time we pray for all of the people throughout Victoria enduring flood damage, and particularly those close to us um, like Graham and Sue. Uh, we remember Kath Ford and Alma Naylor and hope for their recovery, speedy recovery from illness. We think of Jean's daughter, Law Francis, uh, and we think of all of our, um, our own members who are struggling with the, uh, the challenges of, uh, of ageing um, and doing so gracefully. Um, and we pause to celebrate the joy of celebrations for birthdays and for visitors and for just getting together with family. And we pray. God, when we despair of our world where folk are hurting each other, whisper your words of comfort. When we ask, how long, O oh Lord, help us not to give up hope. When we are overwhelmed, with sorrow, lift our spirits to focus on you, our light. For you, for you are a God who will not be thwarted forever. You will not allow evil to have the last word. So God, for all who despair today, whisper those words of comfort. For all who have asked, how long, bring hope. For all who are overwhelmed, be their light in the darkness. For you, persistent God, promise justice for all your people. Amen. And it's our third Sunday of the month when we make special provision to, for, um, for prayer, for surrounding prayer, if anybody would like... Um, some further prayer for yourself or for somebody else, just join us over here straight after the service. Let us stand and sing together, Lord of all hopefulness, Lord of all joy. Go now and continue in what you have learned and believed. Pray always and do not lose heart. Proclaim God's message. Endure hostility. Carry out your ministry fully. And may God be quick to answer your prayers. May Christ Jesus inspire faith within you. And may the Holy Spirit tutor your hearts and equip you for every good work. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>